In fact, in 1974, Stanley Milgram conducted this experiment at Harvard University. Ordinary men and women were brought in to participate in what they were told was a study in memory. They were to play the role of teachers. They were to read a series of words to a person sitting behind a partition. That person was called a learner. The learner was strapped to an electric chair while the teacher watches. Fact: The teacher has in front of him a row of levers labeled from 15 to 450 volts, and a row of switches labeled from slight to severe shock. At 300 volts, the learner suffers permanent damage. At 450 volts, the final death. A scientist is with the teacher. He instructs the teacher to move up one level higher on the shock generator every time the learner makes a mistake. The teacher is supposed to test the learner's memory. He reads the learner a word with four possible answers. If the learner gets the answer correct, they move on. If the learner answers incorrectly, the teacher shocks the learner. He moves from 15 to 450 volts. The learner makes mistakes. The teacher administers shocks. As the shock level increases, the learner starts to protest behind the wall. At 100 volts, he begins to shout. At 200 volts, he pleads with the teacher. At 250 volts, he screams. At 300 volts, he kicks the partition wall. At 450 volts, he stops moving or making any noise at all. He is dead. 65% of the subjects went all the way to the maximum level, and no one stopped before 300 volts. Fact, there were no shocks at all. The teacher thought they were administering shocks to the learner, but the learner was actually an actor who was never really harmed. This was an experiment in obedience to authority known as the Milgram experiment.
consciousness. The totality of a person's thoughts or feelings or a class of these. Perception. Curiosity. Enthusiasm. That's me, Interest. Jack. Or dumb Jack, if you will. Solicitor. Doing my daily routine. Apocryphal. Who is Jack? What does he do? Rewind to a disreputable hotel. We are genetically enhanced to always be happy. But somehow that turned into permanent numbness. Everyone is seeking ever stronger sensations and thrills, ecstasy or epiphany. The strongest is pain. On the black market, the price of drugs, medicine which expired decades ago, is staggering. People buy them for the side effects and overwhelming pain they induce. Pain makes them feel alive. Each time I have to try the merchandise myself to make sure it is top of the line. Fast forward. It is the year 2044 of the Gregorian calendar, or the Jewish 5804, or the Muslim 1466, or the Chinese year 60 of the 78th cycle. Another year of the pig, if that matters. But that's not the story. The story is my name's Jack, or Dumb Jack, if you will. And I'm a regular Joe of 2044. Except for one thing. I know words no one else knows anymore. Many things cannot be said anymore. Many names can't be named. And many thoughts can't be thought. You can still say, I want, I need, I have, but you want or need food, sex, a car, or a house. Not solitude, or imagination, or divinity. You don't know what it means. Virtue, moral excellence, uprightness, goodness, justice, temperance, fortitude. This is a time faith, when many words are forgotten, but I remember. I don't know why, or how, or when I realize this, but I know what all these words mean, and every day I record myself reciting them over and over again so I don't forget. It is dangerous to know so many words, so I play dumb.
cut to the day I met Mateo. It was Sunday or Monday, and not a very special day at all. Do you think Ed went insane? So the story goes. Aren't you curious about your father? No. Your father recorded these videotapes. He left them with me for you. Tell me more. That's all I know. The first tape is just a series of old photographs, so I want you to use your imagination now. See Ed preaching in his church. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. Ed Crowley became a priest because he doubted God, but desperately wanted to believe. Doubt, however, persisted in his mind and actually grew stronger as the years passed. As Ed saw it, the world was deteriorating in front of his very eyes. And what he was doing didn't make any difference. He couldn't save anybody. Through him, everything came into being. Less and less people came to his church. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. Then one day, everything changed. I'm listening, son. I'm an accountant. Go on. Bless me, Father, for I've sinned. Don't be afraid. I've seen the documents, the secrets. I know they know. My life is in danger. But how Calm do down, go? son. Calm down. You don't understand, Father. Do you know what zenith means? What? Zenith, the highest point in the heavens, directly above the observer. There's a secret society of men, and they're pulling the strings behind all the events in the guise of tolerance and brotherhood, but really seeking to further their privileges. The seeds of which were unwittingly planted hundreds, thousands of years ago by an idea appropriated by the secret order and made into the laws of the land. This system was perfected over a very long time, able to control the masses and keep them dumb and numb. Zenith is the time when the sun comes into its peak, after which there follows an inevitable decline. But this decline will become horrendous because these men will not relinquish their control. Society will crumble. The vast majority will suffer. But this tiny movement has prepared for themselves. They will survive. From that moment on, Ed becomes obsessed with conspiracy theories and mysticism. He starts searching for the truth of it all. Do you really think you know the truth? Do you really think you know what's going on? Worst of all, he started preaching about the grand conspiracy and mysticism from the pulpit, which eventually got him kicked out of the church. 
Three years later, Ed is married to a reformed prostitute who gives him his only son, Jack. The next tape I find a couple of days later among the few belongings I had left over from my mother when she left me at the age of four. Why did I search there now? Call it a hunch. Edward Bernays, the inventor of public relations, states in his seminal book, Propaganda, that we don't realize to what extent the words and actions of our most influential leaders are dictated by people behind the scenes. Ed lives in a housing project in East New York and makes money as a locksmith. The invisible government is concentrated in the hands of very few people. Although he's not a priest anymore, he still wears his collar because now he sees himself as the priest of truth. They control the habits and actions of the masses. And he's bought a video camera because he can't write as fast as his mind works. The secret society of the Illuminati was formed by Adam Weishaupt of Bavaria in 1770. But sometimes his frustrations would boil over. Actually, the first time he went to the police by himself. At the Majestic Hotel in Paris in 1919, the secret roundtable groups of the United States and Great Britain officially became the Council on Foreign Relations and the Royal Institute for International Affairs. It's the one world government. It's the one world currency. They're trying to take control totally of our lives. Next time he got busted for beating a neighbor, then for beating a customer who wouldn't pay. But Ed was not stupid. He might have been crazy, but not stupid. Virtue, moral excellence, uprightness, goodness, temperance. Let me clarify one thing now. Faith. So I am not interested in my father or his conspiracies. I am interested in why, when, and how language disappeared. Ed knew something about that. Innocuous, harmless. God does not die the day we cease to believe in our personal God. But we die the day our lives cease to be immune by the radiance of wonder renewed daily. Who said that? Dag Hammarskjöld. You know all these words. I'm old, I remember. I can't forget anything. How come I've never seen you? You never looked. And you waited all this time to knock on my door? I don't go out much. What is it? That is beautiful. You're very talented. He likes you. You're very lucky to have a friend like him. I know. For me? Thank you, Nimble. Nimble and Jack, we go way back. Day one, I drop out of medical school and start dealing on the black market. I almost get killed that first day. Nimble saves my life. He's been doing it ever since. And now, Nimble, Jack, and Mateo. It seems like once Mateo sat down on that chair, he never really got up. The three of us, we don't know anything real about each other, but somehow, this night feels like we're family. Some nights I can't sleep. My seizures are worse than usual. That particular night, I decided to distract myself.
Where's my money? Motherfucker, you think I'm that cheap? Sorry. Solace is thy name. What did you say? Fuck you. Wait, wait. Leave me alone. Solid. Get off! How do you know that word? <laughs> Please. I don't want to hurt you. I know what it's to. I just... Have some tea. Where am I? Home. You're home? Uh huh. Why did you bring me here? I didn't mean to hurt you, I'm sorry. Can you at least look at me like you really mean it? I'm sorry. <laughs> You're beautiful. Rich. <laughs> And you fuck for money. Not for money. Well, what? To feel the pain? Fill the void? Solace? I can sell you a lot of pain. I've got good stuff. Do you know what solace means? How come you do? I ask you first. Comfort. And what is comfort? Relief from distress that makes for pleasantness or ease. What is your name? They call me Dumb Jack. Are you dumb? So they say. I don't think so. How many words do you know? More than you. <laughs> Try me. And we? 
boredom, tedium, irksomeness, monotony, a state of weariness. Sadness. Depression, dejection, dinge, dysphoria, gloom, melancholy. Affection. It was nice meeting you. How are you, sir? I'm fine. Have a nice day. You too. Miss Lisa? I'm fine. Have a nice day. Have a nice weekend. You too. Lisa, there you are. How are you, Mr. Berger? I'm fine. How are you? Oh, I'm fine. Have a wonderful weekend. You too. Have a wonderful weekend. Is it a time for your lecture? Yes, Dad. This is your friend. His name is Jack. Nice to meet you, Jack. Nice to meet you. Call me Rudy. Lisa was just telling me about your terrible accident. It just fell down the stairs. Don't make a big deal out of it. What do you do, Jack? I'm a doctor. What kind of doctor? Brain surgeon. Ah, what hospital? Well, kind of freelance. I just had a procedure, you know. Really? How old do you think I am? I don't know. Come on, guess. 35. Close. 85. Well, they did great work on you. Didn't they? I could have gone for 25, but I feel that's too much. 35's decent, don't you think? Hmm. So, you're Lisa's date. Friend. I'm just a friend. I should have known. Lisa doesn't date nice young men like you. I keep telling her, but why should she listen to her father, right? Listen, thank you for everything, but I really should get going. Certainly, but please, Jack, feel free to drop by. And not only when Lisa's around, okay? Sure. Rudy. Sure, Rudy. Have a wonderful day. You too. Business is good, but I don't care. I want to think about Ed and the missing tapes. Instead, I think about Lisa. I lie to myself that my interest in her is linguistic, anthropological, scientific. I try to find her in usual and unusual places. But she's nowhere. Cut to a week later. I put the word out on the street, searching for 40-year-old video recordings. Good money for clues, top-of-the-line drugs in exchange for the tapes. A few false clues later, I get this call. A rich collector wants to do business. He sends us cops to meet me. Let me see your stuff. It's top of the line. Heavy duty prescription tranquilizers with massive side effects. Expired 30 years ago. Oh, oh that is good. Oh. He's 103 years old, reveling in his personal pain induced by excessive drug abuse. 
Are you sure this is what you want? It's very strange, but I have thousands of more exciting tapes. This is it. Hold that thought now. <laughs> 